Dobro več, dame i gospodo, građani i građanke, seljaci i seljanke, vi gledate još jednu epizodu emisije Nešto drugačije. 80. izdanje po redu, možemo reći mali jubilej, a za ovo izdanje emisije pripremili smo vam nešto posebno. Moj gost večeras je poslanik u Britanskom parlamentu i istaknuti član konzervativne stranke koji će nam reći nešto malo više o Brexitu i o tome koliko je on važan za Evropu, svet, pa boga mi i za Srbiju. Moj gost večeras je Nigel Emmons. Nigel, good evening, how are you? Very good, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. You're welcome. So, is this your first time in Serbia? No, I observed elections here a few years ago. Um, I, I love it here. I love Belgrade particularly. I uh, don't know so much of the rest of the country, but Belgrade is superb. Okay, so um, I have just told our viewers that you are uh, an MP in uh, British Parliament. So how has it been for you MPs lately? Awful, <clears throat> in short. Can you tell us more yeah, about Yeah, and we're to blame. Uh, we're always told you shouldn't play the blame game, but that's all I've been doing for the last, uh, particularly the last 12 months, and we are to blame. Because we've got a parliament that, um, uh, of 650 MPs and three quarters of them during the referendum we had in 2016 voted to remain in the European Union. And they cannot come to terms with the fact that when they asked the British people to vote, the British people did not follow their, the instructions of the MPs. The MPs pleaded with them to vote to remain in the European Union and the people didn't listen. So instead of... Um, Normally what happens in politics is the people blame their politicians. In Britain, we now have MPs, the politicians, blaming the voters. It's a ridiculous situation. Oh, okay, so uh, your party leader, Boris Johnson, has uh, uh, suspended the parliament. Was it really unlawful? Well, the Supreme Court looked at it uh, and they decided to what we call create law themselves. They what said, does that mean? Well, it, it meant uh, just uh, there is a, a separation of powers. So you've got the executive, you've got the parliament, you've got the, the, the sovereign, the queen, uh, uh, you've got the judiciary. It's all independent. Uh, and they decided to look at our laws, quite rightly too. And they said, uh, well, in their view, um, parliament should come back. It was unlawful. But of course, it wasn't unlawful until they decided to create this thing of saying, well, you shouldn't have suspended parliament for so long. Okay, so why did Boris Johnson suspend the parliament? <clears throat> uh, well, he only suspended it for roughly one week longer than parliament would normally be suspended during that period of time. We always suspend for the party conferences. That's when each of the major political parties um, have what I call a, a jamboree, a little rally, um, where they all get together and they discuss the issues that are important to them. So we always suspend. Okay. I've been an MP for 28 years. In that 28 years, we've always suspended. So it was just for a bit longer. And it was because, of course, uh, the Prime Minister wanted to get ready for the Queen's speech, which we've now had. Um, and it does take a bit longer to set things up when you're having a Queen's speech. After all, Boris Johnson uh, quite rightly said we hadn't had a Queen's speech for two years. That's normally, you know, we normally have a Queen's speech every year. So it's, we went for twice as long as we normally go without uh, having a prorogation, as we call it, the suspension of Parliament. So, uh, but there you are, we came back, and what good did it do? All the politicians shouted at one another for uh, a week longer than uh, they otherwise would have done, and we're no further on. Yeah, well, that's something we tend to do in our Parliament as well. But uh, why was it such a big deal this year, the suspension? Uh, because they, um, the Remain MP, said we were trying to silence them. Okay. And you got so to laugh. Did, did, you, did, you, did you try to silence them? Uh, all we have spoken about since 2016 in the House of Commons, apart from the odd time we've discussed circus animals or one or two other issues, has been Brexit. We have been talking about Brexit for three and a half years. So for MPs to say, you're stopping us talking about Brexit, you've got to be joking. The British people are fed up with Brexit. They want us to get on with it. And they're sick and tired of MPs talking about it. Uh, they gave us an instruction to get it done. So let's get it done. Okay, so your previous party leader, uh, Theresa May, she said when she was asked what Brexit is, she said Brexit is Brexit. Yeah. And, <laughs> but if you were to uh, explain to someone who does not even know what Brexit is, what would you say? What is Brexit? Uh, do you know, I'm sorry they made that word up. It's, I know it's an easy word to say and it's now you know, in the dictionary, but um, it's independence of your country. 
It's leaving the European Union, it's leaving uh, the single market, the customs union, it's sorting out our own immigration policy, it's us not having to follow European courts' rulings and all that sort of stuff. It's us not paying in billions of pounds every year to the European Union. It's us having control over our own trade policies. It's an independent country. It's like what the vast majority of countries in the world do. They are, you know, they, they, they are not governed by the European Union. There's 28 countries, including us, that are in the EU, and the vast majority, over 200 other countries, are not. And so would I just be, want to be one of the 200. So would it be wrong if I, if I was to say that Britain wasn't happy in the EU? Um, the British people weren't. That's right, yeah. I, I think if you look back to it, a British Prime Minister, a Conservative, I'm ashamed to say, called Edward Heath was the Prime Minister. He took us into the European Union in 1973 without a referendum. We then had a referendum in 1975. The incoming opposition party said, oh no, the British people should be asked. And the British people said, oh right, we should stay in. Now, the European Union of 1973 and 1975, totally different to the European Union of 2016, which is when we had so how the is referendum. Different? It's been, it, we've had lots of treaties which have taken powers away from the UK Parliament and given them to the European Union. And this has happened over, I call it a salami slicing of powers that have gone bit by bit. So a lot of people haven't really properly noticed. But when I became a member of Parliament in 1992, I remember sitting in committees, doing legislation. I was there for hours, fairly well every day. And then when I reflect, fast forward 28 years, I can't remember the last time I sat uh, in one of those committees legislating. It's less and less. You know, a, a, a lot of our debates are called university students' union debates because we can debate things, but we've got no power over it. It's the European Union are dictating and directing the way that we go. Uh, they call it pooling sovereignty. It means that we are allowed to try and influence what happens in the other EU27, but at the end of the day, I'd rather actually have a lot of influence over what happens in Britain rather than pooling my sovereignty and having very little power to be honest on what happens in the EU 28. Mm. Okay so uh, can you explain uh, to us who voted for Brexit? I mean who were the parties uh, that voted for Remain and who were the parties that voted for Leave? It's a, it's a, great, it's a great question that because um, when we had the referendum all the major political parties in Parliament, and in fact, yes, all of them, the Conservatives, Labour, the Liberal Democrats, the Scottish Nationalists, all campaigned to remain in. The campaign was led by my own Prime Minister, and uh, they used a thing called Project Fear, saying what would happen if we dared to leave the European Union. It was ridiculous in the end. I mean, the only thing that they said uh, that they left out of all the scare stories was that there'd be a plague of locusts uh, the day after we left the European Union. It was ridiculous. And so the British people listened to all the arguments uh, and um, you had a number of MPs within the Conservative Party like myself who said, I, I don't care what my Prime Minister is doing. He can campaign to stay in the European Union if he likes, but I'm going to campaign to leave. So. A number of MPs on my own side campaigned to leave. You had the UK Independence Party um, and a, a chap, um, a leading politician called Nigel Farage, who campaigned very strongly to leave. Um, but they had no MPs elected uh, to the British Parliament as such. Um, in fact, they had one called Douglas Carswell, who fought a, a, a by-election and did actually get uh, elected. So, um, but you had most of the newspapers saying remain. You had the left-leaning um, or remain-leaning broadcast organizations who were only too happy to give lots of airtime to the remain side. Uh, I suspect very few journalists would ever own up uh, or ever did vote leave. You know, I suspect you could count them on your fingers of one hand, how many throughout the whole of Britain who voted uh, leave. But the British people, they looked at all the arguments. And I think it's not just you know, what happened during the campaign, they've looked at how the European Union has changed uh, uh, over the, the last four decades and they've just decided, no, we've had enough, we'd like to be like an independent country and, you know, that's what, that's what they voted in the end. And the elites of the United Kingdom haven't quite got over it yet. Mm -hmm. So is Brexit really going to happen by October 31st? Uh, 
Um, well, I'm going to Parliament tomorrow. So let's just give our viewers the setting. Today is uh, Friday. Yep. Uh, tomorrow you're Friday going to the 18th. The 18th. Tomorrow you're going to. So yesterday was the 17th when Boris Johnson and the European Union have agreed a deal. And that deal is being put to the British Parliament on Saturday. Now, we've got a problem because we've got a minority government. Okay. Um, but uh, a number of Labour MPs, um, their constituents voted leave. Okay. So, how are they going to vote? And a lot of them are hiding behind all sorts of things. When they thought there wasn't going to be a deal, they thought there's not, not a chance Boris Johnson will be able to get a, a deal because the EU was saying, well, no, we're not opening uh, the withdrawal agreement. No, we're not doing that. So they thought there's not a chance he's going to get a deal. So for the last few months, they've been saying, oh, we can't possibly leave without a deal. We've got to have a deal. And then all of a sudden, when they saw that the possibility that a deal might be got, they thought, what are we going to do now? And then they thought, we have to have a confirmatory referendum of the British people if a deal is signed. And that's now what they're hiding behind. That's their latest trick, because they think that the British people uh, uh, will vote against uh, um, Boris's deal, and therefore we'll remain in the European Union. That's what they really desperately but want. But didn't Boris Johnson said uh, a few weeks ago, deal or no deal, we're leaving the EU by October 31st. So yeah, what does this thing change? Yeah, well, the thing that's changed is that the Speaker of the House of Commons, who is a Remain voter, we should never know this with the Speaker, they're normally impartial, not this one. And he tore up the own rule book, his own rule book uh, of Parliament, and cooperated, colluded, collaborated. So where's, where's the Supreme Court oh, now yeah, exactly. when it comes to when it exactly. comes to Well, that. of course, he's within his own powers within Parliament to uh, interpret the rules as he sees fit. And of course, he's protected by Remain members of Parliament. And so the Remain MPs, a small number on my own side who are Remain MPs, uh, have all joined together and they came up with their own uh, view, which was that um, we call it the Ben Surrender Act. It's a Labour MPs Act, which said if you don't get a deal by October the 19th, you have to ask for an extension to Article 50. That means you haven't left, in essence, whilst we can then give them time to have what they want, which, which of course is not a general election. They really don't trust the people. After all, the people got it wrong the first time. So we can't trust the, the people to have an early general election. So I know, let's trust them with another referendum and hope that they listen to their political masters this time and vote to remain in the EU. That's what they really want. So what is the, uh, what is the deal that Johnson uh, worked out with Brussels? Well, basically, it is to recognize the special relationship between Northern Ireland and Ireland, uh, so that there will be different customs relationships for uh, Northern Ireland. But Northern Ireland will be out of the customs union, it will be out of the single market, but it means that there is not a hard border between Northern Ireland and Ireland. So on things like agriculture, which is for all intents and purposes, one of the major things that goes back and forth between Ireland and Northern Ireland, a lot of milk going back and forward, um, that uh, they will be aligned uh, to the standards of the European Union um, and the same for manufactured goods, but they only constitute a small amount of what Northern Ireland produce. The vast majority is services. Uh, and uh, so in essence then, the United Kingdom, will be out of the customs market, out of the single uh, uh, market, out, uh, we'll do our own uh, immigration policy using a, um, something based on the Australian uh, targets that uh, they've got there. We won't be paying money in to access the customs uh, union any longer. We will not be justiciable by the European Court of Justice. We're going to be an independent country, can't wait. And why is Ireland such a big deal for Brexit? Uh, because of the troubles, uh, because of the troubles that went on for decades. A lot of killing, I'm afraid, went on between Ireland, uh, Irish uh, nationalists uh, and uh, uh, people who want to remain part of the United Kingdom uh, within Northern Ireland. It was very bloody indeed. And so uh, a peace process was uh, brought forward so that there uh, could be peace within uh, Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement, it's called. And the last thing that they want to see is a hard border 
uh, between Northern Ireland and Ireland. So there's already a special relationship between Ireland and Northern Ireland. I mean, there are different tariffs on things like uh, fuel and alcohol um, and tobacco. And smuggling does take place, but the North and the South do col um, collaborate together to try and eradicate the smuggling that's there. Um, so if they can do that for those three uh, subjects, why they can't do it for others, I just simply don't know. But they used it. The European Union, I'm afraid, used it and the Romanians used it as a stick to keep hitting Theresa May with. And in the end, it cost her a job. Yeah, so how was the uh, Theresa's May, uh, Theresa's deal different from the deal that Boris Johnson worked out with? Because well, she had this thing called a backstop, which meant that if we hadn't got a proper working relationship uh, between us and the European Union on trade, for instance, our f future relationship with them, then we would all have to remain within this European Union until the European Union decided we could go. That was being, that was like being taken hostage by the European Union. And even worse, we were giving them the handcuffs uh, and we were giving them the only key to the handcuffs. It was ridiculous. And so in the end, her deal was put to Parliament three times. We rejected it three times. So let's jump to the other side. Uh, how will uh, this uh, Brexit um, deal uh, if, the e if, if Britain leaves the EU uh, on October 31st, how will this affect the EU? Uh, do you think that this can be an example for other EU countries to simply leave the EU after Britain does? Well, that's what they fear. They fear that people will look at Britain from the EU27 and see how well we're doing, cracking our own trade deals around the world with other countries. We'll be free to do all of that, and the EU aren't. The EU do all the trade negotiations for the EU27 seven as it will be so if you're a tomato producer in spain for instance and you're trying to do a trade deal uh, with a south american country all of a sudden uh, you'll raise objections to them being able to access eu markets with their produce because that's seen as competition call me old-fashioned but i think competition's good i think it raises quality it pushes down prices and the customer is king uh, the European Union, in my view, has become a protectionist racket. Yes, it does protect uh, wine producers in uh, the European Union and um, or the people producing things there, car manufacturers and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, it does all that. But it's not, not where I want to go. I, I think that the best thing for consumers is if we trade freely in the world. I want to have a good trade deal with the European Union. That'll probably be quite difficult with them because, as I said, they'll try and protect all their own industries. But at the same time, the United Kingdom does buy 850,000 cars from Germany every year. We buy 20% of all their Prosecco production. Can you believe that? Prosecco? Yeah, why? Well, I don't know. Don't like Prosecco. Um, and we buy three and a half billion pounds worth of flowers and bulbs from uh, the Netherlands. We we'll still want to carry on buying all these things from them. We've got a 95 billion pound deficit with the European Union. That's the leverage I want to use when we uh, start talking about our future trading relationship with them. But you're not very fond of the EU, I must say. Right, do you know, I love Europe. Okay. Absolutely is love Europe, Europe. Is Europe the EU? No. Can we... No, it's no. only a small number of the countries. Okay. Uh, it's way larger. In fact, look at, um, do a Google search on Council of Europe countries. Then you'll get an idea of how extensive Europe is. But even the EU 27, I love going to France. I love going to Germany. I love going to Italy and Spain. Just don't want them telling us what to do in the United Kingdom, that's all. I want to, get, I want to empower the British people. So if they think their government is rubbish, they can chuck them out. It's called a general election. And I love general elections. Even though my neck is on the chopping block every time I face my electorate, at least they get to judge how good I've been and how good my colleagues have been in Parliament. And if they don't like us, they can chuck us out. Okay, so how, this, uh, how will this all affect uh, emerging democracies in uh, Europe? Let's say Serbia. Well, I think it's up to individual countries to have a look to see what is the best model for themselves. I think it's up to them. They've got to have a look around the world and see you know, how, how other countries operate, how well they're doing, how badly they're doing. Who's to blame if they're doing badly? Who, who's really to take the praise if they're succeeding? 
And I don't think it's up to anybody else to dictate to countries how they should behave. But what, what do you think? What, what should Serbia do? Should we go into the EU or not? I think it's up to Serbia to make that decision, to look to see whether they like um, uh, how the European Union are doing things. But they need as much information as they possibly can. They've got to know what they're letting themselves in for. And that was the real problem with Britain. <clears throat> When Britain entered the European Union in 1973, it was nothing more than a trading bloc. It's a cust you know, it was um, a common market. And we were told that, because we had this referendum in 1975, that actually the common market wasn't changing. Well, the common market changed. And they had lots of treaties which were never put to the British people in referendums. Not a single treaty was ever put to the British public. So from the Maastricht Treaty, uh, in 1992, right through to um, the um, uh, Lisbon Treaty, which was the last one we had, it gave and transferred more powers to the European Union. In the end, you know, if people are really honest, politicians are really honest about it in the European Union, they would say that they want a United States of Europe. They want to turn the EU into a country. Well, if that's what they want, great. But you've got to take the people with you and be honest about it. That's all. Um, and so, it, so you think that's what they want? I do. I absolutely do think that they want a country. They, they, they want to be like the United States of America. But can they ever be? It's up to the people. It's up to the people. And if they're really angry, and there's a lot of Euroscepticism in countries like Germany now, France, uh, Italy, lots of other countries are saying, hold on now. And particularly uh, Poland and Hungary saying, well, we want to control our own immigration. And they've been rather shocked when they've been told you can't. You've got to be able to take in what, what we say from the European Commission. And it's come as a bit of a shock to them. And so all I would say is, number one, know what you're getting yourselves into. And secondly, is there an, an emergency exit? Can you get out? Uh, and you've seen how they've tried to make it as difficult for Britain. So, you know, you just have to know what you're letting yourselves in for. So, last question. <clears throat> what are your predictions? Uh, will the EU exist in 10 years? I really do not know. The, I suspect the real answer to it lies with the people of the EU 27. It's up to them to decide if they're going to take, well, be subservient to a bunch of bureaucrats in Brussels who dictate to them how to behave. It's really up to them. Uh, and if you know, they want to go down that route, then that's fine. But if they don't, and the one thing is absolutely for certain, the Europe of today, if the political elites within Europe get their way, will not be the Europe of tomorrow. It is going to change. And just as you've now got a currency, you've got a passport with the European Union on it, uh, you've got an anthem, you've got a flag, you're then going to have an armed forces, you're then going to have a common taxation policy, common foreign policy. All of a sudden, you know, the common market of the 1970s becomes the United States of Europe of 2030, let's say. And that's totally different to what, what it currently is. And it's up to the people if that's what they want. If they want a United States of Europe, then fine, go with it. But I just wish the European Union were a bit more honest. I can see that you're totally in the EU 27 state of mind. Yeah. Thank you very much and good luck with Brexit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much Hvala. for being at the show. Hvala vam. Hvala vam što ste nas pratili i pratite nas na svim društvenim mrežama, naravno et na STDRGC na Facebooku, Twitteru i Instagramu i uživajte u životu, a najčelije ja ćemo da nazrimo. Cheers. Oh. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.